action. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Grudge Report featuring The Expanse. I'm Margaret Reeb, a member of the development team at the SETI Institute, and I am joined today, as always, by Franck Marchi, who is a senior astronomer at the SETI Institute, chief scientific officer at Unistellar, and who received a PlayStation 5 for Christmas. I'm not the least bit jealous. But we are here today not to talk about that, to talk about The Expanse, specifically episode three of season five the latest season that just dropped on Amazon Prime Video. If you're new to The Grudge Report, please go ahead and consider listening to the earlier videos before you hop into this discussion today. If you're new to The Expanse, or maybe you're not caught up in The Expanse, hit pause, get caught up, and come back because we are going to spoil everything. Spoilers will abound, and the show is so good. Trust me, you don't want to be spoiled. So, Today, let's get into the nitty gritty of season five, episode three, Frank. I'm really excited because a lot of things have kind of come to a head in this episode. And the first scene itself was to me very interesting and exciting. It happened on, on Luna. What did you think about that scene between Abisarala and her pal, who uh, Admiral Delgado, I can't believe I forgot his name, and then the scientist. Dr. Alawi. Alawi, yes. So Dr. Halawi is, a, is an astronomer, probably, but he's kind of the old fashioned astronomer. We always have those. Um, <laughs> he seems to believe only in mechanical things. So that's why he has a watch, a mechanical watch and so on. So- You mean that relic, what did she call it? Uh, an yeah. artifact or something? It's artifact, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I like, I like the scene because it's totally, is the future that I would like to live. Um, I study asteroids. I study asteroids with a group and we are searching for, we're trying to understand the size and shape of asteroids. And what basically it shows in this holographic display is exactly what I would love to have. More holographic, <laughs> yeah, like we <laughs> talked about last time. Let's remind people that what is, up, they're talking about this asteroid that fragmented before um, flying by Venus and uh, they got data from the station, the scientific station that was at the time observing uh, Venus. And um, so what it does first is basically has a 3D shape modeling of the fragments. And he mentioned that the fragments are a string of fragments, a pearl of fragments. String and of that's ty typically what you expect to see if you have an asteroid which is being disrupted. And that's not something coming from um, sim computer simulation. That's what we have seen. Um, in 1992, in July 1992, uh, Shoemaker Levy 9, a comet, a flyby uh, Jupiter, the planet, and uh, this got disrupted because of the gravitation. And uh, in fact, these fragments came back to Jupiter in July 1994 and hit the planet. And you probably have seen those pictures of. Uh, um, a pearl of fragments, comet. Hmm. And then when Jupiter is being hit by the fragments, you can see the tiny uh, explosions on the surface because it's of like mimicking the, the formation that they're in. Interesting. Yeah, so this was ha happened probably before you were born, but I remember this time. In 1994, I was at the observatoire, the Pic du Midi. It was my first time in an observatory. I was a student at the time and they invited me uh, to do two of a tourist. So that's the way I, I start, that's the way I started astronomy. I'm giving you were a tour guide. <laughs> I was a tour guide at the Observatoire de, de Pic du Midi in the south of France. And everybody was there. Like all the famous astronomers at the time were at the Observatoire uh, to record this observation of the impacts of shoemaker levy 9 on Jupiter. So that's really, that's first thing that came in my mind when I saw that. Well, and then they talk about, um, it looks at the display of, of the fragments, the shape of them. So asteroids are not spherical, as you know, because if a body is less than 400 kilometers in diameter, typically it will not reach what we call the hydrostatic equilibrium. So it will not be, it will not have this spherical or ovoidal shape most of the time. I'm gonna go back to that in a. Is that due to gravity? It needs that's to due to gravity yeah. and also internal internal structures and also the composition of the asteroid. Right. 
So they're made of rocks, so generally they don't have, they need more time to be, become spherical. Round out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so he's, doing, he's looking at those fragments. And uh, so for us, when we see an asteroid, we don't see the shape of the asteroid. Most of the time we see a tiny dot moving in the field of view. And that's all. And we are super excited about that because from this tiny dot, we measure the light. And from the light, we get the shape and so on. He has better data, obviously, because he can see the fragments with much better accuracy than what we can see ourselves. Right. And uh, he can also see the shape. And he noticed that uh, one side seems to be different than the other one, probably because they were covered. This asteroid has been covered by, with uh, Steel's technology. Right. Provi- provided by uh, Mars uh, military. Maybe. Maybe. Probably. <laughs> did, I, did I spoil something here? I don't no, know. not at all. I mean, I think that's what the show is setting up, but I don't think we've quite connected the dots. But yeah, I mean, I think it's safe to assume it's definitely Martian stec- stealth technology. But is uh, Dr. Lau is very, is very kind of uh, the scientist, the dry scientist. I noticed that too. Because when she asked him, so what will happen is something like this, it Earth, the same size, roughly, than the one that was detected by this Venus uh, um, scientific station. Right. The first answer he gave is not possible. Because we have spotters. So it's basically, he believes in the technology so much that he thinks that it's impossible that an asteroid like this will come to impact Earth because we will know because we have those spotter satellites that I mentioned in the previous show capable of detecting um, an asteroid coming to ours. Right. Yeah, he was very nonchalant about the whole thing. Yeah, it was like, nah, it's probably it's probably because this is kind of the old technology for them because they solved this problem. Right. right? The defense has been solved thanks to those post- spotters. So they don't have to think about it anymore. It's like if you ask me some questions about how we do electricity, I would probably right. tell you, you know what, it's not that, it's all, all science, okay? We've got bigger problems to yeah, worry about. Yeah, bigger problems to right. solve, exactly. But to go back to it, then she, I, I like this uh, this actress, uh, I can't remember her name every time, but she's- The actress who portrays Avasarala. Yeah. She's, she's great. She's great. She's brilliant, in fact. Uh, she insists it, and she makes it like, what if? Tell us what will happen. And here is a lot of science. I could talk about this forever. So if I'm too long. Well, is it accurate? Let's, because I jotted down, what does he say? It's an iron nickel core traveling at 30,000 kilometers per hour, assume a 10 to 30 meter in diameter, right? Those are the things he rattles off. How does that sound accurate to you, or does that just I, sound like I, I have to go for each number one per Okay, let's go through them first. So go first, he says speed. 30,000 kilometers per hour. The typical speed of an asteroid is 17 kilometers per second. So I'm going to convert everything in kilometers per hour so we can get an idea in comparison. So that's 61,000 kilometers per hour. So, and the typical uh, speed of a comet is 183,000 kilometers per hour. So it shows the lowest speed as possible, half the speed of. A, a, t- a typical asteroid. It shows this value because it basically shows the minimum value, which is the impact velocity or the escape velocity of Earth, which is 39,000 kilometers per hour. I will put the number on the board next time. <laughs> <laughs> so it shows, the, it, shows, it shows a very slow asteroid. Why not? It could have chosen a, an average number, but it decided to take the, the a slowest one. Right. Then it talks about an iron core. That's interesting because most asteroids are C-type asteroids. Remember I mentioned that those are made of very fragile uh, material, dark, like uh, basically uh, carbonous, carbonaceous chondrite ast- meteorites. So okay. very fragile. Uh, we say, I don't have the number on top of my head, but we say 70, 80% in the main belt are made of that. Then most asteroids, the rest of the asteroids are S-type, made of rocks, okay? like Vesta and so on. Iron, nickel, uh, asteroids are very rare. There is not that many of them. And he chose this one for some reason. I don't know why that's the, one, the first one that came in his mind. Maybe it's related to the, the Steels technology. I was thinking about that. Because the Steels technology seems to be a military technology developed by Mars, Mars to hide the spacecraft. 
right. which are made of metal. So maybe this works only if there is metal on the surface of the asteroid. That's a really good point. Yeah. That's maybe the reason. I just found out. I just just made up this talking to you. So I'm it was sure brilliant. I'm glad I was here for it. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> All right. And then he calculated that he will produce uh, an explosion of one to four megaton. He doesn't say the unit, by, by the way. He's megaton of TNT. That's the full unit. Which uh, seems to be a lot, right? Like, what yes. he's estimating seems to be a fair amount. So to give you an power. idea, Hiroshima, the explosion in Hiroshima, the first nuclear explosion on Earth was 1515 kilotons. So this is something like he's 100 times more powerful than Hiroshima. Not good. So now I went through the details of the calculation. Uh, there is a very interesting paper that was published, I have the reference here, by uh, Gareth Collin, Melosh, and Marcus. I will put the reference. It was published in 2005. It is basically an Earth Impact uh, FX program. It's a web-based interface that you can play with. You enter as a, as a parameters the size, the speed, the impact angle, the density of the asteroid, the type of surface the asteroid will fall on, if it's ice, water, or, or right. a solid surface, and the, um, the inclination, basically. What is, what is the inclination versus the impact angle? Can you talk about that? Uh, this is, yeah, it's the same. So um, if an asteroid hits Earth coming from the zenith, that will be a zero degree inclination, basically. Zero degrees from the zenith. So full contact. Yeah, is full hidden, contact. Yeah. Of course, most of the time, asteroids are not coming exactly like, like this on Earth. And most, most of the time, they impact Earth on, with an angle, okay? An elevation angle or a zenith angle, depending mm -hmm. on what you want a, a reference you use. Right. The higher is the zenith angle, the less energy uh, will reach the surface because the asteroid will cross the atmosphere longer and be basically disrupted by the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. We are very lucky to have an atmosphere on Earth because it's protecting us against small impacts. Most small asteroids, three meters diameter, will burn into the atmosphere and will never reach the surface because of this combination of atmosphere plus the, the, the angle, the impact angle. So would that mean that Mars maybe has more impacts than the Earth because of the lack of atmosphere? Yeah. And I was thinking about that yesterday, uh, yesterday when we did the show, after the show, we were talking about uh, the fact that Earth has a planetary defense program. And the yeah, they never talked about Mars. We did not talk about Mars, but let me talk about Earth. And we, you mentioned, well, finally, they solved the problem of funding. And you know the reason I think they solved the problem of funding for planetary defense is because they have a base on Luna. Luna has zero atmosphere. So a tiny telescope of uh, a tiny asteroid of one meter will be a disastrous. Uh, we have a disastrous impact on the lunar base. Interesting. So that's probably the reason. I'm totally making up stories here, but it's a science fiction show. But that could be the reason for which planetary defense on Earth is so robust, because right. they need to protect lunar bases, which has all these. A space spaceport, and it seems to be kind of the way for Earth to connect with the rest of the. Of yeah, the solar it's like a port, sort of, yeah, in a way. A you have to pass through that. Yeah, and no, you that's a really good. That. That's a really good thought. I was, I was saying that it's interesting that we don't ever talk about a Martian planetary defense because if they don't have an atmosphere, they would probably benefit from one too. But we always hear about Earth planetary defense Be maybe because um i don't know maybe the flux of asteroids on mars is lower than the flux on, on earth and that's something i could check it probably yeah. papers showing talking about this yes or maybe they report back we don't talk about it because earth, mars has not been attacked yet by the belters so yeah yeah maybe they're just not as worried about it yeah. for a variety of reasons so this opening scene is full of interesting science anything else that you haven't mentioned yeah, so I will send the, the website so people can play with this and make this, the simulation. <laughs> so what you can do with the simulator, you can decide how far you are from the impact, okay? So I play with the parameters, and it's true that the angle, and he say that in the, in the show, the impact angle is the key part here. Um, 
if the impact angle is 30 degrees, so very low, most of the asteroid will burn into the atmosphere and we have only debris on the surface, no crater. If the impact angle is larger, like 70 degrees, you will form a one kilometer diameter crater on, on the surface. Mm. So the energy is the same, but in fact, what's matter to us is not the energy in the upper, in total is the energy that will reach the surface. Right. If you located one, kilo, one kilometer away from an one kilometer diameter crater, you have very strong um, earthquake, uh, you're gonna be hit by the uh, by what they call the air blast. Yeah, the um, shock wave. You can you will look, yeah the shock wave glass window will shatter, this high temperature etc. In short, it's true that such a small asteroid, ten to thirty meter diameter, made of iron, will have an impact on Earth if the impact angle is large, larger than thirty uh, degrees typically. All right. That's scary to think about, but luckily there's no Marcos in our universe right now. And we do have asteroids. We do have asteroids. That's very, very true. We have one and million asteroids that could potentially cross the orbit of Earth. When? We have detected 10,000 or 20,000 of them only so far. And 100,000 of them are larger than 10 meters. If you had infinite funding, Frank, would you create a planetary defense shield yeah. the way that Earth, the Earth, Earth in the show has? I think it's very important to address the problem of planetary defense because the likeliness is low, and the uh, the simulation that I mentioned to you to you also provide uh, the likeliness of such an event. Oh, so interesting! One will happen every five hundred twenty years based on what we know on the population of asteroids. So it's not unlikely, right? Well, Every 500 and, years? 520 years, you said? Yeah. That's nothing in comparison to the age of the universe. So it seems like, you know. Or even the age of our own civilization. I mean, it's, right. it's could happen, it's significant. I mean, it's very localized in this case, because we're talking about a, kilo, a one kilometer diameter crater. But imagine if this happened on the very densely populated area like New York City, Tokyo, etc. That would have a huge impact on the economy of the of, uh, of our planet. Could wipe out completely a country almost if it's land on a very small country with one large city. I mean, it's it's not something that it's it's unlikely, but it's it's something that will happen. We know that one day or another. Another. And planetary defense is all about finding those asteroids, pre predicting the, this kind of event in advance to be able to divert them. Because it's easy to divert, it's not easy, but it's possible to divert an asteroid. We just need to know well in advance when this will happen. You make a plan. Yeah, to make a plan. So we do have a, a, a ground-based telescope that's observed Earth, but they are not very, um, they're located mostly in Hawaii and in the United States. Which is kind of sad because most of the time, uh, Hawaii and the US are either under clouds or, um, or we can you see only one side of Earth, right? It's very limited in its yeah. scope of what it can see, right? Yeah. So it would be great to have um, an array of those telescopes, either on the ground, but also in space. And in fact, a long time ago, I would say five years ago, <laughs> I. <laughs> I wrote a proposal to develop an array of small CubeSat that will deploy the mirror in space. And the idea was to have a swarm of them, like very low cost, uh, typically 60, 100 of them. And they will basically be able to observe the sky continuously. And every time they detect a uh, potential asteroid, send an alert to the to Earth. Uh, this was a program that submitted to NIAC, the NASA Advanced um, Program. I didn't get the funding, and uh, the program ended here. But if I had funding, that's the kind of stuff I will do. I and think it's really important, too. Yeah. It's incredibly important. I mean, it, we saw what it did to the dinosaurs, and it was not a pretty picture. So okay. I feel like more people should be concerned. But... I think maybe we should talk about some of the larger asteroids that seem to be 
stuck in place, thankfully, for now, um, because this show does a really good job of of name dropping asteroids and, and creating this environment and the belt that seems real. So let's see, we have Palace, which is important because in this episode, Naomi, who is a member of the Rosanate crew, who's looking to find her son. And she lands on Palace. There's a station there, a belter station, and she is looking for her son. Um, not much scientific happens on Palace, though Naomi does encounter some people from another life, which she sort of reconnects with some folks, and then she ends up being kidnapped by her son. But what do we know about Palace, the asteroid? Is it feasible that in the future there could be some sort of cool you know, dive bar scene on this asteroid? So uh, I'm going to brag you again. The first picture of, resolved picture of Palace was published in uh, February 2020. Wow. So that's the first picture showing Palace, the entire surface of Palace. It's, a, it's amazing that we know this asteroid, uh, uh, Two Palace, that's the name, Two Palace, was discovered in probably in 1870-ish, right? And we only now have taken a picture of it. Like we know the surface, we know craters and so on. So what we found out, and this was done by a, lead, a, a team led by uh, Pierre Vernassa from the uh, Laboratoire d'Astrophysique de Marseille and a lot of other institutions in the world, including uh, the SETI Institute. I'm one of the co i of this project. So what we did, we basically used uh, the eight meter class telescope in Chile, the European uh, observatory there, the very large telescope, equipped with an adaptive optic systems. One day we give an entire lecture on adaptive optics, basically a way to get an image like if the telescope were in space. And we observed Pallas for uh, multiple days, taking advantage of his rotation to see the entire surface. And now we have a 3D modeling of Pallas. Using these large telescopes, we've been able to see very small details on the surface of Pallas as well. Uh, we can see details up to uh, 20 kilometers, roughly. And something very surprising came out from this observation is that Pallas is covered with craters. Like he has a, really? Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I wish put a picture on the on the show, but uh, journalists call the name better than us. They call it the golf ball asteroid because <laughs> it really looks like that. It's yeah. Kind of very cool. He has a lot of tiny tiny holes, a lot of small craters, and it's a very large body. It's typically um, uh, five hundred kilometers. I would say uh, three hundred twenty miles. Um, he has this kind of uh, irregular shape. And there is a piece of it which basically gets uh, chipped out. So we think it's a result of a catastrophic disruption, a catastrophic impact that took a, a part of it. A and chunk all, of it away. Yeah, chop it away. And all the fragments stay around, orbit around the sun, and come back and eat the surface of the planet. So that's the reason the, the planet is so crater, uh, the asteroid is so craterized. We call it planet because, in fact, when a body is as big as Pallas, it's most is typically in the category of dwarf planet. We don't call them really? uh, asteroids anymore. We call them dwarf planet. So anyway, to go back to this, that was the first picture of Pallas, and that's what we know now from this uh, from this asteroid. And so I, it's I definitely say, big enough for a bar and a belter station. It sounds oh, it's, like it's huge and. It's a C-type asteroid, so it's made mostly of this carbonaceous chondrite meteorite material. Probably so it's softer. Well. Yeah, right. softer. Earth, probably have water on the surface and organics, uh, water in an organics. And there is a mystery on it that we Ooh. mentioned in a paper. What is it? There is a white dot on the surface of the asteroid. There is an area which is super white, very bright. And we don't know what this this is. We have no idea of that. We have no idea. We have an idea, but we have is no- Is it water? Do you think it's water? We think it's salt. So it's probably the same thing that we see on Ceres. Ceres has yeah. also some kind of uh, craters and we see a whitish white spot right. in the Okator. So we, I think we've seen the same here, but we don't have enough information to confirm that. We just have a few pictures. Now we love to, we will love to have a spectrum to analyze the color of this and be able to see uh, right. whether or not is uh, it's salt. 
So yeah, that's, I still that was is a fascinating. History. Well, you bring up series, which has come up quite a few times in the show. I believe in this episode, it comes up because uh, Holden and Fred Johnson are on Tycho and they're speaking to Monica, who they is the journalist that they've rescued. And she has some information about the proto molecule. And that information is, it seems to be a recording that someone sent to her that's either in her phone or in her mind. It's unclear to me. They have some sort of apparatus, but it's a recording of belters who look quite organized kidnapping the scientist who we've seen before i believe he he was on series he came from series who uh he's one of the main proto molecule scientists who created the proto molecule and start not created it because it's an alien technology he's was creating the weapons out of it and understanding it so tell us about series because it's come up a lot is it a planet-sized asteroid? Yeah, it's a dwarf planet. This one is for sure categorized into the dwarf planets, dwarf planet uh, f family. Uh, it was discovered in 1801. It's a very large body, 1,000 kilometer diameter. So it's very, it's roundish. It's a gigantic planet and um, a gigantic asteroid. And in fact, it contained 25% of the asteroid, the mass of the asteroid belt. Really? So it's, is it the biggest one? Is the biggest one, yeah. So it's very, it's a very massive body, and um, we know a lot now about Ceres because uh, the Dawn mission, uh, is a, a NASA mission, basically stayed in orbit around Ceres and took pictures of it. So we know have we have named the craters on the surface. That's why I mentioned the Okato one. Uh, we have a better idea of the formation of this of this uh, the, this body and this evolution. There is still some some mystery, like the presence of those salt in some of the crater. But what, what Don Mission has shown is that, in fact, those worlds are mini geological worlds. They have activity, they have earthquake probably, they have uh, landslides. I mean, it's, an asteroid is way more complex than a flying rock. Do they have volcanic activity? Wow, that's a very good question. So we think that Ceres may have some kind of uh, ocean in the surface and a liquid water area. And what we see when we see the salt is some water coming from the interior, reaching the surface. And the, the water basically evaporates very quickly in the vacuum of space. Mm -hmm. And what you see only is the salt, the deposit, the dry that's water. That's left. Yeah, that's left. Oh, that's fascinating. That was the, wasn't this the big bright spot? Yes, that was, that's yeah. the, bright, the bright spots in the Okator crater. Yes, yeah. Okay. Well, it makes sense that people have colonized series, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> if it's one of the biggest ones out there. Let's see. They also bring up Vesta throughout the series. I don't think it came up in this episode, but what do we know about Vesta? So Vesta is also, was also visited by the, um, uh, by the Dawn mission. 500 kilometer diameter, roughly, again, probably a dwarf planet, very irregular in shape. Um, and in fact, if you look at the picture taken by the Dawn mission, you will see that Vesta was, um, uh, seems to have uh, the pole, the thousand pole has been kind of again shipped away. There is a lot of craters as well in this area. So Vesta was kind of a mystery uh, because when we analyze the color of Vesta, the spectrum, and we analyze the, um, the, some of the meteorites, we saw some similarities and slight mm -hmm. differences. So now we think that during this impact, during this disruption, a lot of fragments went into space and some of them reached our planet. Those meteorites um, are in fact pieces of Vesta. Vesta wow. is a very, very special body. It's kind of differentiated as well. Uh, we think it has the kind of structure come, come, like an avogadro. <laughs> so we have with a, a very dense nucleus and a surrounding by a very porous um, uh, layer. And yeah. then a very dense crust. So that's yeah. interesting. <laughs> yeah. I did not know that Vesta was going to be that interesting. Um, what other asteroids, any other ones that come to mind that have been mentioned in the show that are worth talking yeah, about? Yeah, they talk about Agia. And I could not remember when exactly they talk about this one. So Agia is number 10. So the 10th asteroid discover. And once again, I'm going to brag here. Sorry. <laughs> So in November last year, uh, we published the first picture of Agia with the same program. 
And uh, we show that Agia is very um, regular in shape. He has this kind of uh, spheroidal shape, which is the equilibrium shape that we expect for a body of this size. So that could imply that Agia is in fact not an asteroid, but a dwarf planet, based on the Another definition one. of a dwarf <laughs> planet, yes. It's, um, <clears throat> so this picture has shown us as well some craters on the surface of Agia. We are in the process of naming them, naming those craters, in fact, so. How are you naming them? Can I put in a recommendation or is it very so, official? <laughs> we decided for each asteroid, we're gonna go to the name of, um, the source of the name, and we're gonna name based on the on the source of the name. So it's all related. Yes, so it's all related. Sense. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if it's the god right, of yeah. uh, medicine, we're gonna name uh, the craters on names of people related to the field of medicine, for instance. Yeah. Etc. For others. So we're working on that. It's a lot of work, in fact, to to do this. There is a proposal to write, and then the International Astronomical Union will uh, decide whether or not they accept the name uh, we want to give them. Good luck. Yeah, I'll let <laughs> you know. Best, yes, please keep me posted. I'm very intrigued. Okay, well, I think um, we can move on to Mars, but is there anything else? And of course, we're going to talk about asteroids for a little bit at the very end of this episode. But in the meantime, is there anything else worth noting about the asteroids that the Belters occupy or asteroids in general? Yeah, there was one thing that at the beginning of, the sh of, this, of this episode, they show the trajectory of uh, the asteroid, and they say we'll, it will impact Earth in 22 hours, right? Hmm. And then there is the name of the asteroid, and the name of the asteroid is 50 E75689. So, so I Google it, it does not exist. <laughs> <laughs> now, I will say usually, this is not the way we name asteroid. In the 20, 20, in our century, okay, maybe in two hundred years. We'll yeah, maybe they just got bored. <laughs> just now like... we name our asteroid by uh, the year, two letters, and the number. So two thousand ten AP ten was discovered in two thousand ten. A sorry is the half months in the year, and P ten is the is a number which defined uh, the ranking of this asteroid in this uh, half months. So sometimes we discover 400, 600 asteroids in one half month. So those are nomenclatures we call that that we use at the moment. And uh, probably we're gonna have to change that because we're discovering more and more asteroids. So many. Yeah. We, have, we, we know so far 1 million asteroids in the entire solar system. I can give the exact number uh, later on because it's a number that changes every day, mm -hmm. uh, but it's close to 1 million. And uh, with the new uh, uh, telescopes like LSST uh, and uh, others, we think we're going to know probably 10 million asteroids in the next five years. In our solar system? In our solar system, yeah. So that would That's be a lot, lot of uh, naming asteroids, etc. So maybe we're going to change the nomenclature. That's something we're probably going to consider in the future. Yeah. Would you ever not name an asteroid or would you name it simply because you want to be able to keep track of it? So uh, th those, what I describe is a temporary name. Mm. This is a name that you have given to an asteroid which has been uh, seen and confirmed. When the orbit of the asteroid is being refined, we give them a number as well. So for instance, um, 2010 AP10 is a nomenclature name, but he has a number two, which is 106152, something like that which is the number of the asteroid into the discovery list, okay? Yeah. Uh, my, my asteroid, I have an asteroid name after, my, after me called Marchis, because that's the way we say my name. <laughs> and, uh, and the asteroid is 6639. So it's a 6,639th asteroid discovered so far. Um, when an asteroid has been discovered and is ranked into the population, you can ask for, you can request for a name for this asteroid. So mm -hmm. the SETI Institute um, participated to a campaign with Unistellar to name 1919, uh, 1919 AP10. And uh, we are going to submit a proposal to name it Ada Carrera, which, which was a famous uh, um, uh, amateur astronomer in Mexico, 
and also she was a motorcyclist. She's a woman who has an amazing life and she fell in love with astronomy and she's participated to uh, uh, the world of astronomy, creating clubs of astronomy uh, in, in Mexico. So we are going to try to name this asteroid after her. First. That's a great idea. Maybe one day we're going to name an asteroid Margaret Reed. Maybe, maybe. I'll have to I'll have to figure out how to contribute. I need to get my unicellar telescope so I can start contributing to citizen astronomy. Um, yes, that would be lovely. Uh, put it on my bucket list. So we've talked a good amount about asteroids. A lot of stuff happened in this episode, but not too much science. But I think it's good to talk about Mars. Because on Mars, Alex, who is a navigator of the Rosinante that has returned to the Red Planet, he calls home. He and Bobby, who's the ex-Martian Marine, who also happens to be one of my favorite characters, they've been teaming up to try and figure out who's at the head of this black market weapons deal that's going on between the Martians and the Belters, at least that's what we think so far. And um, Alex is attacked after he has dinner with a woman who works very closely with the I believe admiral the martian admiral that they think is involved he's attacked um they obviously want to kill him because he might be getting too close to something and bobby magically appears to save the day and my one question about this frank is um what is the risk of using guns on a space station because i certainly wouldn't want to fire a gun and have it pop a hole <laughs> in the piece of metal that's protecting me from suffocating. So um, guns have shown up on and off on the show. And I'm just curious if, I mean, maybe they have some super great, you know, metal that they're using that it's resistant to getting pierced. But I'm, I'm curious what you think about that. I think it's a dumb idea to, to use a gun with a projectile into a space station. For multiple reasons, one is because you're in space, so you make, a, as you mentioned, you, you make a hole, uh, hole in the hole, so then you will lose your, your atmosphere and your pressure. And also, if the spacecraft is probably full of very sensitive um, electronics and sensors, so you have no idea what you're doing uh, with, a, with a projectile like that. Um, in Mars, they're not really in a space station. Remember, they they cave they're in a cave underneath the crust of a, of a of a mountain so well it's it's interesting because sometimes yes they're not on a space station but i guess i mean they're on this sort of artificial they're in an artificial environment yes. to be more specific and sometimes they're under caves but other times you seem to have sort of like this nice window out. It's like the bar to me seemed like it wasn't necessarily in a cave because you have these windows. But I mean I guess if you were in a cave you could use a projectile like a gun because maybe it's okay. I don't know. You don't care if you don't care about your neighbors. That's true. If you don't care about your neighbors, <laughs> that's also something you need to consider. Yes, and maybe the Martians are just very used to living in this um, artificial environment. But if I were transported there, I would be very careful not to disturb anything, as you know, so that my environment doesn't change in a negative way. Um, I'm very surprised that 200 years in the future, with all this great technology they have, they're still using guns like that. But, you know, I don't but know. Maybe, you know, maybe those guns have these kind of sensors that uh, stop the bullet when you reach the, the, the hard structure, like um, the, the hull of a, a spaceship or the container of a station. Maybe. Yeah, they just bounce right off. They know yeah. better than that. They Maybe. basically stop. I don't know how. <laughs> it's, it's, open, right? it's possible. Um, anything else on Mars that's worth noting for you? No, I've spent a, I spent. Frankly, I spent a lot of my time on this asteroid thing for this episode. I said this is gonna be the episode when I'm gonna say everything about asteroids. So. I did not pay too much attention about the Belters and uh, I mean I watched the show, yeah. But <laughs> That's <laughs> good. I've analyzed the series. Well, uh, then I think we can kind of get to the plot threads that connect us to the end of the show, which was a complete shocker to me. So we have Camilla Drummer finds the has found the ship of her friend who she has presumed dead, but now she knows is dead. Ashford is killed by Marcos, our big bad for the season, who is the mastermind behind sending these asteroids wrapped in stealth technology to Earth. So Camilla is on Ashford's ship. 
the data cubes have been taken. But she does find a recording that Ashford has left of him, Ashford, talking with Marcos and Marcos revealing his plan. And so Camilla sends that to Fred Johnson. It's a game of uh, planetary <laughs> or interstellar telephone because she sends it to Fred Johnson on Tycho. And Tycho, sent, or I'm sorry, Fred Johnson, who's on Tycho, sends it to Avasarala on Luna. Avasarala, who has been trying really hard to get people to understand that there is a threat, that Marcos is you know, sending these asteroids towards Earth, that her pleas go unanswered. She gets this message um, that is quite disturbing and proves that she's right. And then we cut to what I believe is South Africa, where we see a man on the beach. And it's not South Africa. Where is it? Uh, Senegal. Senegal? I think it's Senegal. I, I thought the language was a um, South African language. No? I don't think he speaks. Well, it's, it's perhaps on the continent of Africa. <laughs> Regardless, the poor man on the beach meets a terrible fate. What is because... it? Did you notice what he's doing? No, what is he doing? I, I posed off. You never watch a show with me, and by the way. Just, uh... <laughs> Are you constantly pausing and doing sort of, some sort of mathematical uh, calculation? Uh, yeah. anyway, <laughs> so he's having this kind of uh, artificial inte intelligent glasses. He looks at fish. And the uh, glasses will, will tell you what, what you're watching. So what kind of fish. Oh, what the fish is. And, uh, and so on. It's really cool. So he's not fishing. He's looking at fishes. It's like the way that people nowadays bird watch. He's exactly. Fish watching, essentially. <laughs> A new hobby in the future. That's very, that's, I did not catch that detail. I was more concerned with the explosion. So yeah, the, an asteroid impact Earth, a 10 to 30 meter asteroid made of iron nickel, <laughs> uh, reached Earth. And you can see the, there is a blast. It land on the ocean. So probably there will be a tsunami as well. And there is a shock wave coming to him. And the shock wave is uh, high temperature and vaporizing basically, in short. So it's probably located very, very close to the impact uh, crater. It was probably something like 700 meter away from the impact zone, sadly. Yeah. Badly. Yeah, it was, it did it seem like a, a good representation of what something like that would actually look like to you? Uh, I don't know, because my knowledge about this is Armageddon and Deep Impact. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I'm glad that none of us have firsthand knowledge of what yeah. it would look like. Now, we do have uh, simulations that show the effect of an impact on tsunami, uh, producing tsunamis, and so, etc. Um, but basically, the, the air blast and the presence of uh, and the explosion the intensity of the lights is kind of what we could expect, of course. I don't have the details of the calculation of, of, to, to, to back up my, my, my statement here, but that's, uh, that's, yeah, that's an explosion. It will look like a nuclear explosion anyway. Yeah. Uh, well, it seems like Marcos, part of his plan has come to fruition in a very, in a very unfortunate way. I am curious how much they talk about um the like the details of the fallout from this because it, it, you know and uh there was an impact on earth in a previous season i believe it was a martian Michelin. it wasn't an asteroid but um you know they talked about the, the casualties but they didn't really talk about many of the other things like the things that you were talking about could happen if something hits earth like the collapse in economy i don't know what it could mean for the atmosphere all all sorts of stuff but i'm hoping that they'll kind of talk about this a little bit more with this asteroid because uh there are more inbound and this this explosion looked terrible so we'll see i've seen the next one so i don't want to say anything because i don't want you to i haven't seen it yet <laughs> <laughs> well Thank you, Frank, as always, for breaking down the science of this episode. And thank you to all who are watching. If you enjoy the show, please check out the buttons below. You can subscribe, like, you can get updated on when the next episode will drop. Um, and of course, we are a production of the SETI Institute, which is a nonprofit research organization 
concerned with finding the origins of life in the universe and also the nature of life in the universe. So um, if you are interested in learning more about the SETI Institute, you can visit the website at SETI.org. And if you are interested in supporting the mission and efforts like this, the Grudge Report, you can donate whatever you're comfortable donating. So thank you so much for tuning in and we will be back soon with the next episode. Thank you.